there's going to be a wedding, our joy will soon begin. In the evening when the cattle train comes in. In the evening when the cattle train comes in. Amen. Good job, Isaiah. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yes. The coffee pot is on. Hope everybody's awake. Uh, we want to start uh, by continuing our discussion and kind of wrap things up uh, from the morning session. And uh, we're going to also field a few questions. Uh, we could. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of okay. a caveat. Um, some of the things we've been sharing, um, more with me than with Mark, which was very clear, but has been, um, a brother's brought to my attention, he's very right. It's been a little bit more abstract and more conceptual. But if you stay tuned, uh, we promise at the end we're gonna do a sort of a long diagram and give you an overview of the big picture. But uh, as we go through, a lot of the questions that are being now asked will actually come up in our study of Daniel. So just bear us out. Uh, and the other thing is I was hoping, I understand Brother Steve was gonna keep a document, of, uh, a running document of the questions that are being asked. So even those that we don't presently answer, we're going to come back to you because, you know, we're in a war here. It's, this is not just academic stuff. Uh, there's a lot of passion here and zeal for a burden and for a vision, and it needs very much to be defended. And we actually are asking some of you guys to join in the fray with us and become apprised of some of the hard questions that, that this raises and look to God together for a corporate answer. Uh, our heart is to not only give what's coming, but why it's coming and what God's after in all of us, what his heart is and how these things are going to meet Jew and Gentile and the nations. Um, so I think uh, Steve asked a, a golden question this morning that we barely touched on. I wanted to invite that. If he feels that now's the time, I don't know, but um, just that we would not abort that excellent question. Uh, if nothing else, let's, let's ask that again and, and, be, uh, and be looking for an opportunity to answer that. You asked a question about world evangelism. Wait, can you can you re uh, come back to that, Steve? It's basically, touching on the fact that where Western civilization or generally the corporate church at large has missed the point and completely ignored and set set aside Jews yeah. in outreach. I think a, a, a little short answer to that is that we've lost the context. That the framework, the apostolic framework of how the of how the mystery of Christ and the gospel, when that broke in. How radical a word that was. That was a word that was a, Jesus himself, he embodied himself a stumbling book, uh, stone, uh, the disallowed stone. Though precious, on the other hand, also a provocation. God is always creating a, a paradox that, that surfaces um, uh, our natural enmity. You know, and he's always doing something to pick a fight with the principalities of power, so to speak. Because through that struggle, Revelation comes. The, the law was given to bring us to an end of our strength, but so also is the mystery. Th it is not easy, at least not for the flesh. It, sure, there's a sweet simplicity about it. There's a clear yea and amen in Christ, and that's all true. But there are hard questions because God is having us wrestle like Jacob with him so that, there, so that through the grace that comes to give an answer, the Bible says the righteous studies to answer. Study to show yourself a workman that needs not to be ashamed and be ready always to give an answer. So... We're not looking only to the Lord for an answer among us, whether what our eschatological or prophetic perspective or position is. We're looking for an answer for Israel. And something, something when the hard questions come from the Jew, because God has given us the Jew to stretch us. As Art would often, he so prophetically, intuitively uh, captured that scripture. I think there's more to it, but Art was right on when he said that the Jew was given to us for our sake. They are, they are of God appointed to be that formidable um, opposition that literally stretches us. And if we're indifferent, if we look at them like, you know, they can get on board if they want to and whatever, they don't, we don't see the, the mystery that's being worked out. Well, we'll despair, conveniently despair of the Jew when he's been given. When we know that until he's in his place, the nations will be out of joint. And that the greatest heart we have for the nations has to go first through Israel. And right now, mm -hmm. Paul saw, as Mark so well pointed out, Paul saw sort of a roundabout way of reaching to Israel. If he accomplished his, his uh, apostolate to the Gentiles and, and realized its full ideal, he knew very well that would move Israel. So his ultimate end, why? Because art was art all about, I mean, was Paul all about Jews? No, it was about God. 
first God and then even the nations, but he knew the way to that was through Israel. So I liked what Mark did this morning about that funnel that's top, that comes to this narrow little, little uh, uh, middle part and it goes out. But God is very selective. It's the scandal of specificity. And so if the Gentiles just see this thing as some, uh, some universal deal, and they don't see the context of, of, a, of a people who have been, for the moment, you know, bearing the hidden face of God and so forth for our sake, and they don't see the issue of election, the, the issues in which God has ordained to draw something up and out of all of us are to really subdue and bring to the death that, that humanistic claim on God. You know, at the end of the day, what was it, what's, what's all this interplay between Jew and Gentile, the turning of the table, what's it all about? Well, it, Romans 11, I think it's 29 there, gives the key. He has shut both up unto, belief, unto unbelief, that he may have mercy on all. So you, you, you remember the old song, while on others you were calling, do not pass me by? Well, that's what the, gen, the Jew is to be provoked when they see that. When you see God blessing someone, and you know it's not because of any virtue in them, and there's not, you, 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 you emulate that. And so God's after that. And the other thing is, is that none of us have any rights on God. He's proving that to the Jew. He's proving that to the church also. That's why he so gravely warns the church. But uh, when this... When this construct, this framework of this mystery will be restored to the church, it'll go a long way toward moving us to move them. And if we don't know what we're about and where God is going with the age and, and, and the purposes of God, the eternal purpose of God, we'll be kind of in the woods. We might win a soul here and there, but the real objectives, the real long-range goals of God will be, you know, neglected at, at, at least, if not disfigured and distorted. So, uh, uh, Back to our point about the evangelism of the nations, the early church were missed, you know, they, they were not expecting the Gentiles to be blessed at Israel's expense. It was no secret that the Gentiles would be blessed in the day of Israel's resurrection, when the nation would be restored. Uh, the early church was not the only ones looking for a great tribulation. The Orthodox Jews, some of them to this day, still look for that. But they, they knew the redemption, that the end of the exile would bring the redemption, and then the Gentiles would be blessed. But here's this great anomaly now. Here Christ has come unexpectedly as the stone of stumbling and the one who would make atonement. The mystery of two comings was hidden, deliberately hidden by God, foretold indeed, and in retrospect, gloriously foretold. We see it. Paul says, I'm not saying anything that the prophets and Moses did not say. So the, so the key uh, in the early church was to prove that the, that the mystery... That, that what was being preached, the so-called kerygma or the proclamation, was, was nothing other than what was all foretold, albeit in a mystery. You know, because God's doing things through a mystery in his conquest of pride. And so by making it impossible for the flesh, so blessed are you, Peter, or blessed are you, whoever you are today, when God will open this to your eyes, it will touch your heart. And it'll move you in a whole different direction because you'll begin to see, you know, what he's after. But, but the early church was aware of a coming tribulation and a future for, for, for the Jew. And they saw themselves not as a separate entity broken off and off creating a, a new world Christendom, a new institution. They saw themselves like a corporate Jeremiah. Like a, the, they saw the, the early church, including the, the Gentiles that were coming in, saw themselves as part of and belonging to Israel. Mm -hmm. That they were like a corporate Jeremiah, the, the righteous remnant, the masculine, bearing the tribulations of, a, of an apostate you know, people, bearing their judgments with them, going down to captivity with them, mm -hmm. you know, and calling them, knowing that, that, that God is not complete in his purpose at least, and, 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 the, and the end cannot come until they come. And so the, the, the church saw themselves in a way of, like Jeremiah, in a corporate travail for Israel. And Paul knew that for Israel to come to that, the Gentiles had to come to their place. And I think that's something of what he meant when he spoke about a fullness of the Gentiles. When the Gentiles will come fully into their place, then not only will it be the full number, not only will it be the full, but it'll be the fullness of, of God's intention that he's, the point he's making in the church. Because before it's glory in Israel, it's glory in the church. And he, so he's, he's preparing a bride. Now, you know, our, our loved ones who die in the faith and all that, they're part of this. But God is after a corporate demonstration in the church, visibly, publicly, on the, on the real stuff of earth, just like he is with Israel. So that's, that's getting the context back where we're going. Now what we need to do now is look at the nuts and bolts, because this, uh, this position, this view that we have is rare, comparatively rare. We're not the only ones. We have Saphir and Barron, and we're on the shoulders of giants. So yes. this is not a novel view, but it's comparatively, I would say, probably among the real competitors of, for, for 
the, uh, the different views on prophecy, it's probably the most rare. That doesn't mean it's the most correct, but it's just, it's very rare, and so there's much against it, and we want to defend it and show the evidence for it. And so that's the thing. So we don't want to shy away from the hard questions that, that come up. Mm -hmm. So we're going to keep a log of those questions. And uh, yeah, go ahead, my brother. That gives context to Peter's refusal to eat with the Gentiles, despite the fact that he had been shown at least three times that to call nothing unclean that the Lord had made clean, he still couldn't accept it. Yeah. And if he was, he was as spirit-filled as anybody ever was, mm -hmm. that he still couldn't accept it. So he's a perfect illustration of what you're saying about the early church not recognizing the incoming of the Gentiles. And That's right. Maybe we need to be reminded ourselves of the same yes. thing in reverse. Yes. I think we. I think it's Good so helpful. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. It Mark. does. It, it, work, it works in reverse. Uh, what th what's happened over the last two thousand years is now Gentiles have called the Jews. Uh, uh, unclean, and they, they're now saying, uh, and God is tr instructing, saying, what I have cleansed, do not call common, do not call unclean. So the tables have turned. I agree, I, I had that insight just uh, in the last few days, and uh, it's very true. It, 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 it's, it, it works in reverse. Wow. Brother Red, what about the Jewish dispersion starting in 70 AD? It, I mean, they look what happened to them, it makes them look insignificant, and, and why bother with them? They've been cast out. I mean, three, four, five, six hundred, seven hundred years went by, and they mm -hmm. were in exile out of the land. They just dwindled in the importance of the church, I think. Yeah. And they can, were, I, can I answer, David? Uh, and I think that's a mindset many Christians have that they don't even realize. Oh, the Jews, they rejected Christ. He came to his own, those who were his own did not receive him. You know, I just don't have any, uh, why Why go? You know, the, the, they've rejected Jesus and uh, there's no passion for Jewish evangelism. What I really am coming away uh, with from this morning's session, Mark, and you did such an excellent job, just a challenge to be proactive all the more. You know, the, the scripture talks about it. I will send fishers and they will fish for them. I will send hunters and they will hunt for them. Mm -hmm. And I and I, I believe that uh, the time has come to be proactive, seeking out those relationships, seeking out. Uh, you know, we have such abilities to uh, through the internet and others to communicate with a lot of people. Send a New Year's greeting to a Jewish doctor or a friend that we might have to send a Hanukkah card, to keep the relationship going, because out of that relationship is going to be uh, birth opportunities for discussion, for witness. Maybe it's not going to happen overnight, but I challenge everyone. I, I Based on, you know, to the Jew first, the, the mandate that we have to uh, seek out possibilities to minister to Jews. And they're in every community. You know, it's like the, the, the passage that was quoted that uh, when God uh, uh, set the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 bounds, the bounds of the borders of the nations, of the nations, he did it according to the, uh, the sons, sons, of, of, sons Israel. of Israel. But it's like there's Jews in every country, and it's almost like God has set Christians in every community beside Jews almost for the same purpose, that... You know, there's six million Jews in America, the same number as there is in Israel. Uh, they're in all of our communities. We walk into them, walk by them every day. Probably you don't know it, but to uh, to be proactive in seeking out the Jew on a friendship level first. It all starts with friendship evangelism, not, but that leads to other things. I like to tell the story of in the late '70s used to drive by the synagogue all the time. Every Friday the parking lot was full and, and I used to drive by and think, man, I would like to, I'd really like to see what's, what the service is like there and meet some of these people. I had passion for evangelism to Jews and one day I stopped, parked the car and I went in and sat in the service. Afterwards uh, there was bread and wine and uh, fellowship. I met Jewish friends that day, that today, we still have a great relationship. 
Every Passover, I'm invited to their homes to sit and enjoy uh, the lamb or to enjoy the, the Seder together. And uh, last year, uh, someone from that first visit that I had had to that synagogue in the late 70s, I was sitting there at the, at the Passover and they invited me and here a table full of Orthodox Jews. You know, the plate was set for Elijah. The cup of wine was poured for Elijah. And the thought just came to me, you know, I'm here in the spirit of Elijah. You know, at one point during the Seder, they go and open the door. They opened the door for me. They poured a cup of wine for me. Here I am at this Seder. And one of the Orthodox Jews, Phil, why do you have such, where did this love for Israel come from? Well, can I tell you a story about how I met the Lord? And at that Passover Seder, I shared the gospel with a group of Orthodox Jews. But it all started with that little, tiny little act of obedience and stopping by the synagogue, introducing myself to these people and uh, have friends to this day. Still, we're in, we're in a great relationship. I just want to encourage everybody by that. Um, I mentioned something of the Hosea. You know, you're introducing some of them didn't even know yeah. about Hosea. And another another guy from the same synagogue that I visited back in the '70s recently had a hip replacement, and I've witnessed to, to this man, and I've uh, I've shared with him the gospel for many times, and and he had a, had a hip replacement, and I called to see how you're doing. You know, just again keeping that friendship evangelism. You know, having a, a genuine concern for his health and his uh, healing and. And I called and I said, Stanley, how, how, how are you doing after the hip replacement? And, uh, oh, he said, I'm having a rough time and all that. But he said, Phil, uh, since I'm laid up, my rabbi is coming down from Cleveland next week. I want you to stop by and meet him. So he invited me to his home, 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, to stop and meet his rabbi. Well, I go there and this rabbi is a uh, guy that comes down from the Hebrew Academy in Cleveland all the way down to Canton every, every Sunday. But I walk over to Stanley's house and I go in and here, it's not only the rabbi, 14 Orthodox Jews all with their keeps, all sitting around this table. And, uh, and here the rabbi is giving a teaching and, uh, and we have a, uh, I hit it off great with him. We had some, it's an interruptible type, similar discussion to what we're having here. You can stop the rabbi at any time and ask the question is the format. And, uh, I happened to ask him the question, tell me, can you tell me what it means to have a circumcised heart? You know, Paul says he is not a Jew that is one outwardly, but he is a Jew that is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart. You even mentioned that this was Paul in the New Testament. No, uh, and right? no, I didn't, oh, you no, I, I didn't mention that, okay. but uh, he, uh, I was quoting Paul in the New Testament, but the, the passage is in Deuteronomy 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and he got a big smile on his face. He said, that's a great question. Let me tell you about circumcision. He said the word circumcision means to open up, you know, the cutting away of the for, uh, flesh of the foreskin so life can come forth. But he says it, to have a circumcised heart means to have a tender, open heart towards God. And, but he smiled when I asked him the question. But anyhow, we had a nice discussion, and uh, the relationship is ongoing now. But he left, and went back to Cleveland, and as we were sitting around having coffee and cookies, all of a sudden my friend Stanley says, Phil, I want you to tell my friends your story. <laughs> and, and this was, I had shared my testimony, and all of a sudden on a Sunday afternoon I'm sharing about Jesus the Messiah with the most orthodox group of Jews in our city. They didn't kick me out, they listened. Uh, uh, an interesting story, my testimony of coming to the Lord my first year of college living in a fraternity house well nobody threw rocks at me nobody stoned me we had just a great time of sharing and uh, they were friendly to me open to me there was no hostile uh, uh, response to the gospel and I left but guess what they invited me back we want you to come back next week well I came back the next week same thing, 2 o'clock. Rabbi was there again. More question, more relationship. And uh, I had shared with Stanley 
I said, you know, I'm going to be teaching on the book of Hosea this fall. I just started my class this last week. And uh, I said, uh, I'd like you to come to my class. I just invited him. And uh, he said, now, Hosea, Hosea. And he was kind of looking like this. And these guys, Orthodox, they're strong in the Torah. The Torah is everything. But they're weak on the prophets. Good point. And uh, I told him the story of Hosea. You know, Hosea was that holy prophet of God that God told him to go and marry a prostitute. Oh, that's not in the Bible, Phil. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, it is. Let me show you. And I told him the story of Hosea. And he was fascinated that this was in the Bible, that a prophet of God married a prostitute. And I said, you know, she, she, after a while, was unfaithful and had some kids outside of the marriage. I said, one of the kids they named Loami, which means not mine, not my people. The other one, Lo Ruma. And he was just fascinating. And here, a little bit of my study of Hebrew came into play. But afterwards, I went into the prophecy in chapter 3 that, again, go and marry this woman, even though she's an adulteress. And he went and bought her. You know, he emptied out the cupboard, so many bushels of barley, emptied out the bank account, so many shekels of silver. And he went and purchased this woman. Like the field of great price. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he said, you're going to stay with me for many days. You, I'm going to be your husband. You're going to be my wife. And, and then uh, the prophecy comes forth. The children of Israel will will be for many years uh, without sacrifice, without uh, altar, without uh, teraphim. But in the last days, they will come seeking the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. And he was fascinated by the story. Just had never heard it. The guy's 72 years old. But he said, but again, I just can't understand why God would ask a prophet to marry a prostitute. I said, well, he wanted Hosea to feel the same pain that he feels towards his wayward wife, Israel. Mm -hmm. Oh, he says, so Israel's the prostitute. Is that what you're telling me? (laughs) I said, well, this is the story. Okay, well, I had told him this uh, some weeks before. When I went back the second week, Rabbi gave his talk. We're again drinking coffee and eating, uh, breaking bread together with my Jewish friends. Then Stanley said, Phil, I want you to tell my friends the story of Hosea. (laughs) And all of a sudden, all over again, and nobody had knew the story. Orthodox Jews, dressed in black with kippah. And I'm telling the story. You talk about apocalyptic evangelism, the use of prophecy in evangelism. And as I was sharing, it's like I was created for this moment. And I just saw lights going off in the minds of these people sitting around this table. Anyhow, I'm still going. And uh, some of the rabbi went on vacation for a few weeks this summer. But this is an ongoing thing, so pray for me. But uh, it all started again with that little bit of obedience back Mm -hmm. in the late 70s. I visited the synagogue. When you you went that first time, were you open about being a Christian? I mean, what, what did you, how did that go? When I went the, the, to the synagogue that very first day. Oh, yeah. Yes, I, I told them I was a Christian and, and that, yeah. that, that I loved Israel, you know. The founder of our organization was a Jew, by the way. <laughs> He's one of our boys. Yes, yeah, Steve. Uh, Maybe you should start study of John. Yeah, because. <laughs> Yes, but, but again, these opportunities exist out there. And this has been something that's been cultivated for many years. But wow, it's, it's like God is opening things up here. This Jewish neighbor of mine is excited about my story and is excited about what I'm teaching in my local church from the scriptures. And uh, it's just the beginning, I believe. It's a picture of things to come. But I just want to challenge all. I'm a plain, ordinary guy. I'm nobody. But here I've had the opportunity to share the gospel with some precious people. I think a real key is to be very upfront about your Christian identity and your love for the Jewish people being based upon your reading of the Hebrew scriptures and that you're not seeing a, a divide there. Uh, there is a divide over the issue of Jesus. You respect that, that's understood. 
But um, I, I was talking the other night about my experience with the young man that was coming home uh, from the yeshiva. And by the way, some of us said, that, did, I, I didn't answer. I said to the young lady, this man, I prayed that he would come and sit by me. Someone <clears> said, you didn't <throat> say if he came or not. No, he did. He came and sit immediately by me. So it was a real testimony to her. And I had the faith, by the grace of God, of course, that this man, but my prayer would be answered. So I told her, I've prayed that young man. He was just entering the front of the plane. He's trying to get on with his little, uh, he has pushing a little child's carriage. He didn't have his family with him, but he was going to his family. And as he came and sat down by me, the first thing, and, and I was talking to Matt a while ago, it's amazing what comes over you. Uh, Art has seen this with me. It's like, you know, when I'm around Jewish brothers, it's not that way. But when I'm around the Orthodox, especially the heavy, the black coders, it's like I become a different, you know, and you'll experience it. Matt told me his experience was exactly the same thing. So it's almost like you hear your father speaking. It's not even you, it's the Holy Ghost in a way that fulfills that scripture. Like personally, I've never had it in any, in any speaking. But when I'm in those little huddles of those guys, especially when it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's amazing. So the better you guys will understand this context, because the Christian, back to this whole point, when you deal with this issue of, of um, Doc opened the question, the issue of an estrangement between God and Israel, it makes sense of Jewish suffering because you're talking about the concept of relentless pursuit. And I don't care if it's 70, 70 AD, but what happened is after 70 AD, the church thought, well, the tribulation's behind us. And that's, many teach that today. It's a tragic, abysmal theological error. But, and we're going to address that. But the tribulation's behind us. There's no more day of the Lord for the Jew. Uh, the church is a replacement <clears throat> and all that. And so the Jew can hook up if he wants to. They don't see that God's not going to rest until they're back in their place. So the first thing I said to this young man, which makes complete sense, I knew very well that he probably thought he was one of the righteous remnant. And if anybody was in first of the line, he was with the right guys, you know. The rest of the Jews can go, can go suffer, but we'll be blessed. But we begin to talk, well, first of all, the first thing out of my mouth was, my, my grandchildren have a vested interest in uh, your, the destiny of your people, because until you guys are back in your place, I said, this is not a safe place. And I said, so uh, we, we, we pray for Israel. Yes. We are, we, we, we're in, in it with you guys because we know we're in it with you. But then we talked about, because I knew very well, he thought, well, you know. Uh, and I talked about, because I knew this, the scriptures, I said, you know, a remnant's not enough. It's not enough that, yes. you, that you good guys, win a, you know, your, your whole nation has got to be righteous. You got a problem. It's, it's not enough that you're the remnant. Even if you're totally righteous, you might be the masculine. You might be the man of insight. You see what I mean? You might be the evangelist to your Jewish people, but until they all come in. And then I was able to reason with him, well, they're not coming in until Jacob's trouble. So look what you've been through. That didn't do the trick. What's it going to take? We're going in all kinds of places because I had a framework of exile. I didn't just see here we have a Christian thing. The Jews are endlessly, they're not even in exile anymore. According to the replacement theology, they're in uh, limbo. They're not in exile because all those scriptures that, that, that Mark was reading this morning, I'll choose Jerusalem always and I, I've chosen you and I haven't departed. It's always comforting Israel that as bad as you guys have acted up, you're still written on palms of my hand. It, there's a bond here that can't be dissolved and I can't rest until you're right with me and I won't rest no matter what it costs both of us. You know? And so when you have this framework of this construct, you can reason with Israel out of the scriptures and even introduce them to things that they haven't considered. But those of them, and many of them do, more than we know, revere the scriptures. And so if, you're, if you have some skill in the prophets, you know, one of the scriptures I took this guy with was, and we'll look at it since, since we're on Hosea, you might want to turn with me in your Bible, but Hosea chapter, uh, chapter 5, look with me at verse... Uh, at verse 14. I'm just going to give you a little exercise because we're being biographical. We're talking about our experience and our confrontation with the, with the synagogue. And uh, But God says in Hosea chapter 5, verse uh, 14, <clears throat> For I will be unto Ephraim, that's a term for the northern kingdom, like a lion and like a, like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. Interesting language. I will go away. I'll tear you and go away. I will go away. And today, as Mark was reading, uh, he will re go to it, come down from his place. Mm -hmm. They understood. Here he says, I will return to my place. It's, it's the language of I've been here and I'm going away. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hide my face. 
What we're seeing now between the two advents of Christ is the fulfillment of Moses' prophecy, which no one knew how or when it would be fulfilled. And he prophesied that the very, you, know, you provoke me with your vanities, I'll provoke you that are not God, I'll provoke you with a people that are not a people. In other words, I'll turn about will be fair play. There's a, there's a divine irony here where, you know, you've, you've, you've hidden your face from me, you've turned, I'm going to hide my face from you. But never, ever, forever. It's always just until, it's always that key word, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, until you will say, blessed is <clears throat> comes in the name of the Lord, until Zion travails, on and on. It's always, it's a key, it, 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 there's not a more important eschatological term than the than that little word, until or till, it comes in both ways. But we're going to see one of those untils right here. Look at this. <coughs> For I will be unto Ephraim like a lion and like a young lion. I'll tear and I'll go away and none will rescue him. It's kind of like 70 AD right here, since Doc opens the issue of 70 AD. I will go and return to my place, listen to that language, till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction, they will seek me early. Now, um, that's significant. Till they acknowledge. Not forever, but till they acknowledge. But many translations, sadly, translate this guilt. It should not be. It's not, it's not, that, that's a poor translation. Uh, it's, tra it's, it's, it's not trespasses or offenses. It's their offense. There is a, con a consummate offense. You know, they did not know the time of their visitation, and therefore I will give them up. Mm -hmm. The scripture says they will smite. Well, back at Micah chapter 5, just for some of you that are taking notes. Chapter 5, verse 1 opens this way. Um, God says, he kind of, there's a, the, the, the prophet makes sort of a mock, and he says, Gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. In other words, since you trust in your military, let that be your, let that be your protection. Gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. Then it says, I will, um, uh, for he has laid siege against us. Why? Because they smote the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. And then it kind of, the passage is curious. It's, it, we're dealing always with a mystery here. Verse 1 says, I'm going to uh, lay siege against you because you have smitten the ruler of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. Sort of cryptic language for the rejection of Messiah. Then the next verse says, but you Bethlehem Ephrata. Now everyone knows the Christmas verse, right? You Bethlehem Ephrata. Though you be least among the thousand of Judah, yet out of you shall he come, which shall be ruler unto me, whose going forth has been from of old to everlasting. Now they don't like that translation, but even they say it's been from ancient times to whatever. So we see in that translation accurately and rightly the absolute eternality of the Messiah. But they have to admit the pre-existence and the antiquity. That Messiah is Messiah before he, you know, that, that this is not just somebody who's going to come and be the Davidic king. This guy's been around a long time. And so this is not just anybody, this is not just any Davidic king, but, but he went away. This Davidic king went away. You're showing them this out of their own scriptures. In verse uh, 2, it says, oh, well, verse 2 does say, this is the one everyone's familiar with. What they don't see is verse 1. You've smitten the judge of Israel, now God has laid siege against you. And by the way, this isn't just any judge of Israel, this is the ruler that comes out of Bethlehem. This is the great king, the Davidic king. Then the very next verse says, therefore, the word mean, means for this cause. I will give them up. This is the divine desertion of Israel. And they can relate to that because they know, even if they think they're the hoity-toity, uh, you know, masculine righteous remnant, they know very well that's not enough. Their people have got to be righteous. They've got to be back in their place. And I was able to reason with them, you are still under covenant violation. And even if some of you aren't, you've still got a job to do. Moreover, God's got a job to do. He's got to get you guys from, from this place to this place. We can talk like that about the church. So in the very next verse, we're talking Micah 5 here because it, it complements so well here. In the very next verse, it says, out of, uh, uh, for therefore, for this cause, because they've smitten the judge of Israel, he will give them up, and here's that word again, until, until she who travails is brought forth. Well, there's that constant and recurrent theme of the travail of Zion. Zion, you know, will travail and a nation will be born after that travail. Isaiah talked about it. Jeremiah says uh, that day that Israel will be saved, saved out of will be the time of their greatest travail so that no other day is like it. Daniel says when that travail will come that Israel will be delivered. And uh, for those who think the tribulation's passed already, then how do, you, how do you answer the fact that the resurrection happens then? Not only is Israel delivered, but Daniel's raised. So everything ends at that, at that, at that 
at that tribulation, and then begins Israel in their final fulfillment of the covenant. So and here's my point. My point here in all this is, as long as it, until Israel's back in that land, the covenant is unfulfilled. It's in a state of being broken, and Israel is appointed to judgment and to tribulation until the very end. And so the, the, now, you've, now you've arrested them. You, you've shown them the saga and the tragedy of their history it has to do with this glorious, relentless pursuit, full of love, but it is a relentless love that, that will pursue them unto... Then I talked to him about Jacob's trouble and about how that Jacob... And he was a Holocaust scholar. Interesting, that this whole thing. And I shared with him how that Jacob is being brought to the end of his power, that the end experience of the Jewish people must be a replica, a, a, a reiteration or a replica of when Jacob, you know, Jacob, you know the story for those of you who are not that familiar, Jacob learns that Esau is coming with 400 armed men. Mm -hmm. And here he is with his little flock, a little vulnerable family. And, the, and the God presents himself to him at the book, uh, Brook Jabbok, and he wrestles with him because he can't let him go because if I let go of God, I'm, I'm toast. It's mm -hmm. over. So he, he, he prevailed with God because God presented himself and required a, a wrestling. And that's what this whole end time drama that we're seeing in the, in the making, it's being cooked up right now in the world scene, is to bring Israel into a re final wrestling match with God. And the church will be in it with them. Because, uh, yeah, go ahead, my brother. What happened mm -hmm. in the moment from when he sent Rachel over the brook? Mm -hmm. The very next verse says, and he wrestled with a man. I've always, I'd like to meditate on what happened between the minute when he saw them disappear into the darkness and he encountered this individual mm -hmm. who he began to wrestle. What happened? Mm -hmm. How did they come together to the point where they engaged and started wrestling? What caused them to do it? That's a mystery in itself. It's just, it doesn't explain it. Well, God set it up. Yeah. He, he ordained and orchestrated the crisis that would make Jacob so desperate. And Jacob's great strength came out of his great weakness. And so after that, he was touched with it in the thigh of his strength and was able to go out and find conciliatory... Uh, 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 I mean, Esau... I, had hit, I see your face as the face of God. <coughs> exactly. Esau had been reconciled because he's... The, the man that he was at enmity with is gone. It's a dead man. And that's why the Arabs are going to see the Jews as a very approachable, you know, the... the go ahead, Mike. My, my point is, Sorry. sort of, is drawing out as we talk. Where is Israel in that process right now? Ra Rachel and the kids have gone. He's standing there by himself for a certain amount of time. And suddenly, a man appears. And however that event occurred, he's now face-to-face -face or aware of another person. What did they say to each other? Where is Israel in that process of engagement between the space that was between them and the point when they came in contact and started wrestling with each other? Is Israel engaged now, or have they come to that point? And is that the time of Jacob's trouble, when they start to wrestle? No, the, the actual Jacob's trouble actually is when, it, when uh, uh, sudden destruction comes upon them suddenly. And in other words, then, then they're, they're brought into a place Domination of wrestling, wrestling and so forth. Until then, they're in a state of euphoria. They believe they're in a, a so, security. So they're in the interim period between when Rachel goes over. You mean where they are right now? Yeah, as a I'm nation? talking allegorically, oh. meaning they're just learning that. No, that, but no, uh, Esau, Esau is not men coming. Are, Esau is not coming with 400 men. They're not helpless yet. Right. Jacob's yeah. trouble requires one ingredient: helplessness. So they haven't engaged yet. Right. Jacob's right. not wrapped around the angel saying, "You're not. I don't care if you kill me. I'm not letting go." No. Right. So they're not to that. So not, that's not there yet. That that's is where they're Jacob's going. Trouble, that? And the church <laughs> needs to tell them that's where they're going. That's my point. So, that, so you can translate, and make sense of. See, the church has the it, the key of interpretation for Israel's suffering. There's a gap of time there that's a mystery because it doesn't mm -hmm. tell you how this event occurred. Mm -hmm. It's just the man appears and they're wrestling. True. Mm -hmm. So my point is, in an allegorical sense, what was the process that led them to the wrestling match? Okay. Jacob being alone. That yeah, he's and that's he, where they he, are he, now. Alone, uh, really, yeah. really, yeah. really yeah. alone. That hasn't because happened yet. Because he couldn't continue forward in his journey into the promised land until his personality was 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 a completely changed. He could not go in as Jacob. He had to become right. Israel at right. that point. Right. He reached a crisis point in his life, and that was the encounter with God there. 
He so came, that's he came to he came he became Israel at at one place only the end of his power. Right. That's right. The scripture says that God will bring them to the end of the, when he sees that their power is gone. That's when this whole thing's over. Amen. Fred, go ahead. The scripture came to mind when you were talking about that. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come. There's no transition there. There's peace and safety, and then suddenly destruction mm -hmm. so maybe there's not mm. and that whole three and a half years there's a parallel there approximately three and a half years not exactly but three and a half years there there's a there's an attrition they're being worn down and their strength is being progressively removed more and more there, there's a complete helplessness there's a pause there a breath was taken mm -hmm. one event ended another chapter of his life was about to begin and there's there's a, you know, a, a cosmic point right there. Where a transition. This, yeah, between, no, mm -hmm. they're not touching. I don't know what they said, but they had to come together and begin mm -hmm. to wrestle. Mm -hmm. See, I, I see it a little differently. Mm -hmm. I see a lack of a transition. He just suddenly appeared and they went at it. And I think the suddenness, I think there's a, there's a, there's a parallel there. As I alluded to before, I think that's how it's going to be. That's how I see it as a man looking through a glass darkly, that there is going to be a, a suddenness where from a human perspective, there is no transition. And I see that repetitively in the scriptures. And just one other thing, I'm kind of going back to something about the replacement <laughs> theology and Israel being cut off. Um, and the two simple questions come and come to my mind when has there ever not been a Jewish remnant when has there ever not been a Jewish believing remnant and then the other side of the coin that enters my mind when has there never ever been a Gentile remnant when has the majority of the Gentile world ever been true born-again believers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh. I'd just like to make a couple points about Jacob's wrestling. Rabbis, if you look at the commentaries, and I have, I have discussed this with a few rabbis, Generally, they agree. They, it's so easy for us to look back and read that and see God all over it in this whole process. They consider that, quote, man that Jacob wrestled with to be the spirit of Esau. They do not acknowledge that that was God that Jacob was wrestling with. Okay? Hmm. That is almost a consistent opinion in their commentaries. That's, they're, they're as poor in their theology as Christians because exactly when you right. wrestle with the Antichrist, you're wrestling with God. Right. The, the, the Assyrian is the rod of his indignation. Right. Mm -hmm. That Jesus said before Pilate, you have no power at all, but it be permitted from above. Right. Nothing happens without God. When Jacob went out there in the, in the, and he was weak and had been touched in the thigh of his strength, jo, uh, you know, his face was like the face of God because God had made, the scripture says, whose ways please the Lord, he'll make even his enemies to be at peace. Yes. So if, 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 if my enemies rise up against me, I'm willing to see that God may have a corrective discipline that's a blessed end in it, but I know very well nothing's happening without God. Right. So the, the other point that that's, I want that's to make is, look serious. at that word used to wrestle there, it's only used one time in all the Hebrew scriptures, and it's defined as... It's, it's a very odd definition that's completely out of place and has nothing to do with what we might consider man against man wrestling. Yeah. And it actually means to be vaporized. That's a, and it's close, the only other word that's even close to it is to be like fine dust or mist. Hmm. Sounds like the cross, doesn't it? Nah, nah, right. Just what it's uh, Jacob Thanks for the poem. That's good. Again. Yeah. I don't. I can't. Well, I, I would Jacob like to say. I would like to say. You know, he it's became pot, light. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I'd like to say he became sanctified. In other words, mm -hmm. he already had a regenerate heart for God. That's right. And um, 
you know, Israel's not just demonic or something. Yeah. They're schemers. They're still they're still finding, you know, like <laughs> like a lot of backslidden Christians. That's right. You know, and they're and they're and God is jealous to bring forth the fullness. Yeah. I travail till Christ be formed in you. So there was a fullness of Christ, the Spirit of Christ that our brother one Peter one eleven always prayed brought out. It was the fullness of Christ that he came into. And that's what and so as Jacob's being prepared for the day of their epiphany where they'll look upon him and they're coming at the end. Before that, there's a, a preliminary travail, I believe, for the church. I'm jumping way ahead of some things I hope we get to later, but uh, the church will be a people in travail. And there will be a, a, an end to that travail when, uh, the, I, this is probably not the time, but where there's, there's this promise in Scripture that Satan is going to be cast out of heaven. Mm-hmm. And that what will mean for the earth, a, a black night of, of unrestrained terror, it will mean absolute jubilation and liberation for the for the corporate body of Christ. Mm-hmm. Yes. While any believer now has access through by the Spirit, mm-hmm. and, and the reason that fullness is coming is because we're we're going to be straightened. It's the straightening mm-hmm. of the church, and we're going to be emptied of our power. Mm-hmm. And that's why. And, and here's the here's the interesting thing that happens in the early goings. Mm-hmm. We see the day coming. Yes, Israel's redemption doesn't come until after their tribulation. But this birthing that I'm talking about is before Israel's tribulation. Because there's two, uh, it's in the it's in the first three and a half years yeah. Yeah. that we we'll are that we later, are developing but, the, right. the, the the travail. Do you follow? Yeah. It's a, yeah. So this is the first first three and a half years when the world is celebrating this peace that has come maybe after a serious regional war has come after lots of calamity and a, the antichrist has come up as a little horn and made a, a nice peace on the earth and that and we're travailing saying no no and the other they're saying why aren't you celebrating with us. And that's where we, we are being formed because then, boom, the mass comes off, the abomination of desolation, and then the, the chaos ensues. You yeah. cannot exegetically separate Daniel chapter 12. Here's a little mnemonic device. It helps you with your... Chapter 12 of Daniel, compare with Revelation 12. Remember the two 12s, the number of apostles. Daniel 12 says, Michael stands up, 12, chapter 12, verse 1, and there's a time of trouble like has never been. Well, where did he get that? Daniel had been reading Jeremiah. Jeremiah, he, he learned by, by Jeremiah of the 70 years. But Jeremiah says at the end of that 70 years, I don't see good things, I see Jacob's trouble. Mm-hmm. When's Jacob's trouble? Well, that's not now, Daniel, it's 70 more sevens. Jacob's trouble's way off out there. But when Jacob's trouble comes, it ends in nothing short or other than the deliverance of Israel and the resurrection of the dead, yes. including Daniel's personal resurrection. So you would have to spiritualize the resurrection to avoid the fact mm-hmm. that the tribulation takes us nowhere short of the of the resurrection of the dead and the return and restoration of the natural branches and that's exactly the time that paul's talking about over there in romans about the deliverer comes out of zion he's quoting isaiah we are so we have so been so dislocated but um this this whole thing with with ah, i've lost it jacob's trouble uh, where am i um 12 yeah don't forget that revelation 12 the, the tribulation in Revelation 12, again, begins when Michael stands up. Remember, he stands up in Daniel 12, 1. He stands up in Revelation chapter 12, verse um, uh, 7. And it says that when he stands up, it's a time of trouble like the world's never seen. And it's Satan's time is short. And so it's given the same time, that three and a half years, 12, 60 days, dividing of time, half a time. So there it is again. And so the, the final crisis of this age has all to do with Israel. But but it also sees the church as the people of understanding. Those that understand among the people shall instruct many. Certainly in context, that would be a Jewish believer. But we can understand there'll be many Gentile believers engaged all over the world. Because right in those days, the great gap that exists now between supply and demand, there's going to be plenty of reasons to ask the right questions. And that's what God's after. But uh, we need to know this framework. We need to know this exilic condition of both Israel and the church, what it means to be a people in exile waiting for the redemption. We've got to get yeah. into that with them. That's what I, what, mm. why I invite, wanted so much to hear from Phil about his experience and my experience, to make this a bit biographical, to show that this is, these are the things that we need to be prepared to speak about when Israel will be coming to our waiting arms. What's going to come upon them suddenly and without expectation, it would be only the false church, only the false church that will not know this. These days are going to be so clearly marked by God that you would have to be in total apostasy with some resolute agenda to resist the incredible evidence of the prophetic word that the church is going to be bringing. Prophecy is the dynamite that blows unbelief away. 
Now, it doesn't mean you're gonna re it's going to regen regenerate you, but it'll sure leave you without an excuse. Hmm. And God's interested in that. Even those that will be damned are going to be seen very clearly to have had have plenty of evidence. Yes. Verse 15 is your key here because it says, till you acknowledge your offense. Now, if you think this is just general transgression, you're missing the point. This is the consummate offense for which say, uh, his, their house was left to them desolate. Mm -hmm. right? So we're talking about the divine abandonment of Israel. Not from the standpoint of God's heart. That mm -hmm. would be mm -hmm. uh, an upending of all that we're saying. But I'm talking about he has had to give them over to this. And look at verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Come and let us reason. Oh, come and let us return unto the Lord, for he is torn and he will heal us. See, Israel's never left in this exilic condition. Uh, oh, and the point I was making a little earlier, in all the references I noticed this morning for the first time, really, that, that, that Mark was reading about this absolute sovereign election of Israel, it always presupposes that they're a mess. That this is not some people who've got their act together, mm -hmm. but this people who have never attained to the calling are being continually reminded. It's, it's almost like the comforts that would come to a, a broken-hearted, bitter, backslidden believer who's really made an abysmal failure. He needs very much the reassurance that he's still the Lord's. Mm -hmm. You know, just when he thinks... This is a, talking about a people who are not in their pride, but who are being told in their affliction, in their wilderness experience, hey, it's not over. It's not over. Mm -hmm. I, have, I, have, I have plans for you. I, my heart is mm -hmm. overturned. I, 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 how could I forget you? This is the key. And so when we're talking to the Jewish community, we're, we're, we're making a connection between their age-long their age historic sufferings and, divide, and the relentlessness of God's pursuit. And he will not despair or give it. In fact, by a mighty arm and stretched out arm, he says, I'll get you there. If I have to, you know, if, 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 I says, with fury poured out, I will bring you under the bond of the covenant. So God's not going to just passively woo them. The day is coming when he's going to constrain them. And that's what Jacob's trouble is all about. Now let's just finish here, and I'm going to get, get back to our study today with, with Brother Phil. Um, Come, let us return to the Lord. This is chapter 6, verse 1. For he is torn, and he will heal us. He is smitten, and he will bind us up. Here's the, here's the interesting thing. I've noticed this. After two days, he will revive us. And the third day, he will raise us up, and we will live in his sight. Of course, Jesus fulfilled that. But this is talking about corporate, the corporate servant of the Lord. Jesus was the personal servant of the Lord, and he, he in every way followed this pattern. It's, it's, it's never correct to, to say an either-or position mm -hmm. about the servant songs. They are intended to be replete with mystery. Mm -hmm. It's the servant, the perfect Messiah servant, who gives himself involuntary, and it's the blinded servant, and both of them are the same servant. It's not an either-or proposition. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a mysterious interface. So you can't just say, well, Isaiah 53 is just about the Messiah, and only here, over here, this is just... It's not that way. The, both things are always true at once. But what Israel endures in their blindness is still used of God to be a testimony and a witness. They still remain His corporate witness. Well, that's another story, but I just think it's a serious error when Christians rob the Jew of the significance that the, that the mysterious, there's, there's four of them, some say as many as six, four songs of the servant. Yes. And some of them, by everyone's admission, could not be talking about the personal righteous Messiah, Jesus. But what, So the church in Israel has stood at a loggerhead over this, at an impasse, over what should be bringing them together. We should say that you're to see the reflection or mirror of your Messiah in your own sufferings. You're to see what he had to bear. And some brothers were really hitting on this this morning by the Spirit. Mark brought it off. I think Matt and some others about the disfigurement issue. Oh, that is, that is plumbing into where deep calls to deep. So do not have your little exegetically correct. You, you're dealing with profound mystery here. And if you, if you lose the, the face of the servant in both Israel as well as in Jesus, you're missing something. Mm -hmm. And uh, no wonder we're, we're, there's such a disconnect. We're, we're not in it with them. They're suffering. What's touching them is not touching us. And this not, ought not to be. Mm. Well, um, just to finish here quickly. So he says it's after two days. The binding up and the reviving, that's the same word for resurrection. This is the national resurrection of Israel. Not at the end of the third day, but to begin the third day. Mm -hmm. And isn't it just mm -hmm. interesting that mm -hmm. they, the scripture says, Your house is left to you desolate. And uh, they did not know the time of their visitation. Some scholars say as early as 26. Never, never does any scholar suggest anything later than 33. But most scholars agree that the cross of Christ was 29 to 30 A.D. Right there. That's the consensus report. Well, if you reckon from that, about two days, that's close to where we are right now. Right. And uh, this is the, the, the time yes. 
that Israel is coming to the end of their long exile. And then what does it mean when they are on the that they're raised after the second day? The third day they live out that third day in his sight as a resurrected nation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what else could John the John John be talking about in the book of Revelation but the thousand year reign of Christ Jesus? Yes, amen. Having now vindicated the covenant, oh, yeah. they they now enter the millennium as a risen people. Mm. You know, there's something beyond the millennium. There is a perfection and there is a complete but but God is not through with Israel. They've not served their purpose until this millennial demonstration of the everlasting covenant has been vindicated on this earth. That is a key to understanding the millennium. If you don't know the covenant, you won't know the millennium. You'll just this out, you know, the Jews see something of the covenant, but they don't see a thousand years. There is a spiritual side to all of this, but God never is content until this thing is embodied and it answers to the literal detail of his spoken word. Because, you know, it may content Christians, but, and, and it certainly makes Satan happy to have the word of God fulfilled off in some ethereal zone in heaven. But what God's going to do is show the, life, the, the, the resurrection power of his life in a people that have come to the end of themselves and all the nations are going to be required to go up from year to year and acknowledge this. What's God after in this? Now let's now let's go back to the Bible study to get the the uh, the, the biblical support. Let's see the, the nuts and bolts. And we'll and we'll, we I hope by the grace of God we will not we will not shy of the hard questions that this brings because I really believe this is not a boast or whatever of academic, but I really believe that though this is a mystery, and that no not not only do we search it, it searches us. Mm -hmm. But having said that, and I know that this is not with flesh and blood, so I'm not talking about, you know, hey, we got our guns together here, but I will say this, you will be glad to see how much the, the exegesis or the sound interpretation, brothers and sisters, it's on our side. Amen. I, I, have no, I have no fear of replacement theology, none, because I know they don't have a leg, they've committed exegetical murder and they haven't got a leg to stand on. Mm. They've been getting to buy with it for 2,000 years, and it's time to call their bluff. That's right. Yeah. Yes. You know, because, because this is not about uh, who's right or who's wrong, who's got a position on eschatology. This is not a little appendage on the end right. of your uh, systematic theology. This is life and death. Yes, this is, is the glory of God. Yes, it is. This is Romans 11. <clears throat> and, 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 you're, and you're only going to get to the end of Romans 11, which Paul says, oh, the depths of the riches. You know, I always take, I say the best place to begin with Romans 9 through 11 is start at the end. Go and see where this brings Paul. Yes, amen. Do you, believer, do you want to miss the process by which Paul comes to this glory? Do you want this vision of glory? Then go back and start with Paul. Deal with Paul's crisis. How can all this come to the Gentile? And what happened to Israel, to whom it was all promised? Ah, was the answer, oh, you've been replaced, you know? No, he takes you right from nine. He shows you the absolute sovereignty of election. Romans 10, he deals with human responsibility. Then in Romans 11, he brings it all together into a crescendo of glory. You know, one is up, one is down. For 2,000 years, the Gentiles, there were some saved. There was a remnant then. You had your, your, your Naamans or whatever, you know. You had your proselytes at the gate. And then it's turned. And for 2,000 years, it's, it, there's a comparative rarity among Jewish believers. And so it's like a switching over. But for 1,000 years, when they're in, come to what's called in, in Romans 11, their fullness well, then it's not like somebody else is back on top. They're back on top, but it abounds the incredible riches. Mm -hmm. And now the universal call of the gospel goes out through a people. And God says, there's this one test I have in mind here, though. Are you going to submit in humble acknowledgement and say that it's okay what I do? And if I'm going to have a Jewish people that I'm going to vindicate my ancient covenant <clears throat> with them, is that going to be okay with you? Mm -hmm. If it is, you get in on it, you get in on all of it. Mm -hmm. But it's like when he said to the Syrophoenician woman, you know, is it appropriate to give the children? He was, he was after that deep thing in man that presumes some kind of claim on God. Had she gone away in a huff and said, okay, if that's the way it is. But rather, she humbled herself and said, truth, Lord. And he says, come on in. Have mm -hmm. a place better than sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the name. Yes. God, God is a God of selectivity. And this is the issue of his rule, the issue of his word. That's what the battle in the heavenlies is about. Satan doesn't care about. What he's caring about is the... So I, I like to say this. There is nothing more spiritual than the literal fulfillment of every word of God. Yes, it, you know, like Satan it. loves it when we spiritualize the scripture because yes. it just helps him with his great Absolutely. question, has God really said? And God's an in-your-face God. He says, I have said it, I will do it according to the letter of what I spoke. You know? The end from the beginning. We may find some mysteries in scriptures. We may find some gaps. We may find an interlude between the Roman Empire and the final end, you know, like we're going to see here in Daniel. 
we may see that, but we will never see a changing of what, script, what the word meant to the original author. There could be a, a deeper spiritual application. I, won't, I would never call it deeper, because there's nothing deeper than God's word being literally fulfilled. That's so in your face to the principalities and powers. <clears throat> and so Christians don't know that they're giving away the farm when they advocate a spiritualizing approach to Scripture. They're really giving away the farm. It's a spiritual issue. It's not just hermeneutics. It's has God really said. So I'm sorry, I get a little passionate here. <laughs> well. <laughs> but I, but, but,